Next thing you know, you know the next thing. Next is Now is a short podcast discussing agriculture's emerging next-gen tech and trends as they're happening in our industry. Next is Now, presented by GFL Ag. Listen where you get your podcasts today. I'm Sean Haney, and this is Real Ag on the Weekend. Let's get real and get connected with the week that was in Canadian agriculture. Real Ag on the Weekend starts now. Welcome to Real Ag on the Weekend here on 650 CKOM and 980 CJME. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com, and it's great to be with you back for another weekend edition of this show. And I want to wish everybody out there listening a, a very happy Easter. Yes, it is uh, great to chat with everybody. Hope you're having yourself a great holiday weekend and everything you're doing in your Easter festivities. Well, today on Real Egg on the Weekend, we're going to hear a number of different conversations, very, very important for your farming operations. We're going to hear from Ann Wasco, the Gateway Livestock Exchange, also ranches down in East End, Saskatchewan. She's going to provide a bit of a market update for us. We're also going to talk about a, a really, really interesting trial that I saw in Southern Alberta over the weekend, and, and that is in, in the drought zone of, of southern Alberta, the Oosterhouses, G- Gerard uh, Oosterhouse, they, they were rolling their snow. So, you know, you got the, the roller that you would use to roll your peas. They're using it to roll snow to try to keep that snow home so it doesn't blow away. We're going to he- talk about that. I got some audio with Peter Weepy Johnson where we talked about it from the Real Ag Radio podcast. And then I, I want to get your feedback it- on it as well. Also, we had some changes to the advanced payments program this week. We'll hear about that. And uh, we've got a clip for you from our Farming Forward series where we talked to Justin Deering with Croptimistic Technologies. We've got some of that audio today, too. If you have any feedback on today's program, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Or, of course, you can always find us across all the social media pro- platforms. Real Agriculture is across all of them. Or you're always more than welcome to call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. Okay, let's talk to Ann Wasco, the Gateway Livestock Exchange, for this week's beef market update. And great to chat with you. It is good to be with you today, Sean. Yeah, yeah, lots happening right now in the in the cattle mm. markets. Uh, last week, uh, some all time highs. This week, a little bit weaker on the futures front. But you know, I, I want to get to the avian influenza and the impact it has had on a, on a few dairy animals. It, it's had some impact on the markets this week. Well, like we always say, Sean, anytime markets are dealing with a surprise or uncertainty, um, this is the reaction. So here we go. Um, the market was already dealing with a bit of a bearish report um, on feed report from last Friday. We'll talk about that in a second. But then uh, also earlier this week, this confirmation from USDA of some of these older dairy cows in Kansas and Texas that had contracted avian influenza. And and just uh, it, so listeners know, it's spread by wild birds, as you've likely heard. It acts like a flu and tends to affect what they've seen and said so far, older dairy cows. So no, obviously no impact on, on um, milk or meat quality, no threat to human health. But this, this has cre- created a, um, a surprise in, in the markets. It does reduce milk production 10 to 20 percent in these affected cows, and then they tend to recover about... 10 to 14 days later. So that's what USDA has told us this week. Um, Markets, especially the futures markets, have responded. Uh, The managed money funds have liquidated their positions, as as they tend to do with these unknowns. And um, and that has put some pressure. So let's start with the cash, Sean. We did see just here this morning, we've seen some southern trade in uh, Texas and Kansas, uh, two lower than last week at 186. The northern trade uh, kind of ranging, just light trade between 183 and 188. 298 dressed, which is about four bucks lower than last week. And again, as you mentioned at the onset, this is after posting an all time high last week for fat cattle in the US. The five area average was 189.56. So that's kind of where we sit. Um, and I guess let's just carry on. The market was also, like I said a minute ago, dealing with a bearish February placement number from last Friday's cattle on feed report. So that didn't help matters either. We kind of were on our heels um, in terms of uh, market action when, when the avian influenza news came out. So what did that report say last Friday? Well, February placements were up 10%. 
But I get kind of I'm going to hedge my bet a little bit. And if, when I add January, because January was so off with that when, with the winter weather in January and February was up. When you put the two together, year to date placements in the two months are up one percent. That was just like Canada for the Western Canadian on feed report. February, big placements. But when you added it to, with uh, January, it was actually down two percent. So I think sometimes when you have these crazy up and down months, it's it's wise to, to look, look at a little broader picture. Mm. And then I, I guess, John, we've, we're heading into a short um, week. Well, we're in a short week heading into a holiday weekend. So um, we have to talk about a little bit about demand. And I think no surprise probably to anybody that's been in the grocery store lately. But on the demand side, uh, pork was the winner um, for this Easter break for sure. So that choice cutout that I always talk about every week, it's uh, down five bucks this week compared to the end of last week. It closed at 308 and a half. And again, pork the winner. Um, it, it certainly is trading at a big discount to beef. And so that's not a surprise in, in my opinion. So I guess some things we'll be watching for uh, as we go forward, Sean, and yeah. see what happens from there. I, I was kind of, and, and not to say it's the same, it's not, well, actually, it's not the same thing, but I was reminded this week during the avian influenza release that came out from USDA, and uh, I believe it was National, National Milk Producers Federation, mentioned like, you know, don't export markets, you know, you don't need to close borders. And it, it kind of triggered a memory for me back to... You know, was it 03, BSE, borders closed? Like, I, I sort of had, like, this mental, like, memory trigger to, like, oh, my God. Like, it, it's just so funny how events can remind you of other situations. You must be Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what that means? Okay. Um, <laughs> no. Hey, you know, no, it, 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 yeah. as we look ahead to the fall here, um, and uh, which is still some time away because, you know, we haven't even really engaged in spring yet. But, boy, I'll tell you, this, this feeder market, it, it's definitely giving signals to ranchers that pricing is, is looking pretty good here for, for 24. Is, is that a fair statement or what are your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. So we're on the supply piece, right? So some of the demand question marks, I think, are valid. But on the supply piece, we know what we've got. And that's a, a considerably smaller um, beef supply in both the US and Canada here in 24. So that's what's been pushing prices higher. It's what will continue to keep the market solid. Now, does the market go straight up like kind of the trend we saw in 23? Well, no, I don't think so. Because last year, we saw the markets moving to this new trading range. Now we're here. And so I think as we go through 24, one of the things I'll be watching for is more of what are the seasonal patterns? So for for fed cattle, that spring high, summer low. I, I'm still kind of leaning that <clears throat> direction in terms of feeder cattle. You know, typically we see the market continue to grind higher as we go through the spring and into the summer and make their highs in August or September. Is that in the cards? I still think that's in the cards for sure. So those are the things that uh, we'll be watching as we go forward. But demand is, I think, one of our biggest question marks. It decides how far can we go? Where do the highs get placed? Was last week's high the high for this year? Um, you know, those kinds of questions, I think, will come out more as we see how demand fares in the second quarter. And, and if we get, okay, I want to get too far ahead of myself here, but if, if we do get moisture, they've got big wet snow right now, which is definitely, it, it make it feel, people feel better about themselves and their grass. Is this the year that maybe people are like, okay, yeah, heifer retention. Well, when you look at some of the markets uh, that are trading right now with some of these re replacement type heifers, I mean, the prices are phenomenal. So I already think, you know, for maybe not for everyone, but certainly for some producers out there, that is what's in, in the cards and driving some of the strength that's going on right now. So, and again, math is math in terms of what, you know, what these calves are going to trade for or what they're expected to trade for vis-a-vis -vis what the cow is worth, you know. So those things are driving this market higher. And I think that will continue to provide strong support as we go through the year yeah like to use this it is you know it, it was opening day this week and to use a sports reference it's uh teams are going to pay uh in free agency is similar to how feed yards are gonna have to pay for feeder animals <laughs> they're they're gonna they're, they're gonna have to buck up um hey so and as we look at the current pricing environment and we, we kind of even talked a little bit about throughout the, the rest of 24 where we are right now Talk about the seasonality trends and what typically happens at this time and in the near term going forward. 
Okay, no, that's that's great to pull out because it is that time of the year where usually fed cattle prices make their spring high, late March, early April. So that's exactly where we are. So with this week's action and the market down this week, do we look back and say last week was the high and the markets are going to kind of uh, trend towards a summer low from here? Or do we still have some time and the market can can recover and shake off this last week's negative news uh, and and claw back. So we'll be looking for that one. And then the other seasonal timing piece that I think is important to keep watching is the that cutout, that wholesale price. So typically, it makes its high in the second quarter. And so we'll be looking for that cutout value, that choice cutout value to keep marching higher. I know it was off five bucks this week, but does it keep, can it also shake off this news and transition high as, higher as we head into grilling season? So those are the kind of things we're going to still be watching from um, uh, signals in terms of demand. And then also on the placements figure, and I talked about this earlier in terms of, you know, do do the imports um, rack up like they did a couple of years ago, or are we looking at smaller imports and then overall smaller supplies for Canadian cattle feeders. So those are two big pieces, but they're hugely supportive to to what's going on with the strong feeder market and these tighter supplies. When you talk about that that you know potentially rising cutout value, where 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 is packer profitability right now? Well, I think you know again at this time of year they're 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 in the red, but see again seasonality of packer margins as they head into the second quarter and they sell that beef for higher money and they buy cattle at lower money. That's when their margins typically improve. So again, going from the red into the black, going from Q1 black, red to Q2 black would be a typical seasonal trend for packer margins, and that's also you know what we're expecting at this point in time. The other encouraging thing that uh, I saw this week, and it wasn't just specific to beef, it's a lot of different agricultural commodities, but Canadian Trade Minister Ng in Vietnam this week, that's an important market for, for beef. It really, Vietnam really, Sean, you know, it's still a small market compared to, you know, U.S. and Mexico and, and Japan and South Korea, but it's coming right on the heels of those. And so anytime you can get some diversity across markets, especially into those Asian and growing Asian markets, it's only good news for a market that's open for Canadian beef and, and especially for uh, for its closeness to some of the other Asian markets. So that's anytime those deals are being worked on is only good news for Canadian beef producers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and- and have yourself a great Easter weekend. All the best to you, and uh, we'll chat with you again in a couple weeks, okay? Okay, thanks so much, Sean. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more of Real Egg on the Weekend here on 650 CKOM and 980 CJME. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. There's a reason we call it the Corn School. Videos on everything from planter setup to weed control, field trial results, and the latest yield strategies. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com. From realagriculture.com or as a podcast in your favorite podcast app, check out the latest Corn School episode today. Yeah, welcome back to Real Ag on the weekend. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. Speaking of realagriculture.com, I encourage you to go there over the weekend and keep up to speed on everything that is happening in agriculture. Lots of great videos, podcasts, written stories, opinion columns, full of stuff. We can't fit it all on this show, so you got to go there to catch all the other stuff. Okay, this week... We had uh, some changes to the advanced payments program. So Canadian farmers have been making plans for the 2024 season. And then now they've been assuming that the interest-free portion of the advanced payments program would revert back to the pre-2022 level of 100000 Well, as of this week, 
Farmers will have access to the first 250,000 interest-free following the announcement by Lawrence McCauley, Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. The advance payment program gives producers access to cash advances of up to $1 million based on the expected value of their agricultural product. Under the program... Producers would normally receive the first $100,000 interest-free, but during the 2022 and 23 seasons, the interest-free portion of the, the program was increased first to 250 and then to 350 but the regulatory amendment did not apply beyond 2023. So producers were planning for this return to the pre-22 levels. Now, Canadian producers have faced a lot of challenges. Like, come on, I, I don't even need to explain them all to you. But, but this change will save approximately 11,950 participating producers an additional $4,900 in interest costs on average for a total savings of up to $58.7 million for the sector. Now, under the advanced payments program, cash advances are calculated based on up to 50% of the anticipated market value of eligible agricultural products that will be produced or are in storage. The program is delivered through 27 industry-led or associations. Advances are available on over 500 crop and livestock products across Canada. I didn't realize it was that many, that many crops and products. Wow. That is, uh, that is very, very extensive. Now, on, on the Real Ag Radio podcast, uh, we, we were, this is on Friday on the Real Ag Issues panel, we were talking about this change, and we had Stuart Person on, who is the, the Senior VP of Agriculture for for MNP across uh, Canada. And and Stuart made a couple points. One, this, this move to the 250 is still under the 350, like I mentioned, Okay, so it's still it's a positive, but it's not back to the 350 level we were we were at. And the other thing he pointed out too is the fact that there's a million dollar cap on this for what an individual producer can access. It it really is not super applicable or advantageous to some of those largest farms, right? So if if you're a 10,000 acre farm. Having a cap of a million is different than if you are a farm of 2,500, right? Those, the, it, the, it's, it's different. And so Stuart had mentioned that that's something that really does need to be considered. Now, this is a point that I know Stuart's made before, and I know it comes up a lot when we talk about programming around agriculture, whether it's this advanced payments program, maybe it's some sort of ad hoc payment program, maybe it's even like in the U.S. with uh, some of the, 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 the trade payments that President Trump had made. Going back to 2018-ish, like around that time, there was caps. Uh, the Biden administration has had caps on some of the farm programming. All in all, it's done for certain political reasons, and that is to so – it doesn't look like governments are unfairly and, – and that's not – that's their words, not mine – but are – more strongly supporting the largest farms, right? So that's why it's it's tailored that way. And it also puts a bit of a cap, I think, too, on the level of spending. But Stuart made a good point. Let's Okay, if you're going to talk about that, then let's also look at the volume of taxes that some of those larger operations pay versus some of the smaller, too. So it, it really is an interesting policy discussion when, when it comes to should there be a cap or not a cap, right? I, I'm more in the camp, I, 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 I would say, of... <laughs> Should we have unlimited? Maybe not, but is the million a little bit of a sort of maybe an old number that needs to be relooked at? I I would say so for sure. We'd love your feedback on what you think about the, the advanced payment program or you know, what about caps on farm programming like this one and, and future and in others. Send me an email, S Haney at realagriculture.com. We've got more coming up here on Real Ag on the weekend. Of course you're listening to nine eighty CGME and six fifty CQM. Get all the information you need to keep your pulse crop healthy and profitable with the Pulse School on realagriculture.com. The Pulse School is a free YouTube video series covering agronomy, research, and more across a host of different pulse crops. It's also available as an audio podcast wherever you download or stream your favorite podcast. Check us out on YouTube or visit realagriculture.com, the Pulse School, brought to you by BSF Canada. 
The Canola School on realagriculture.com is your one-stop shop for everything a canola grower needs. Check out our free video series on YouTube for all the latest in canola agronomy, research, marketing, and more. Don't have time to watch? Download the podcast version of The Canola School on realagriculture.com or anywhere you download your podcasts. Stay on top of all things canola with The Canola School on realagriculture.com, brought to you by BASF and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Sorry, I'm going to set the stage for you here. We're going to talk about now on Real Ag on the weekend. And as in southern Alberta, the o- Ooster houses who farm around Bull Island, very, very drought area, like brutal. It's been awful, right? As, as many parts of southwestern Saskatchewan and southeastern Alberta have been. Now, there's been some snowfall in the last week, and it's it's a very, very nice surprise. It's it's very, well, we'll we will take it. Now, the case is, what, uh, uh, how beneficial will it be, okay? And and probably depending on where you are and how much you got and the moisture content and all that kind of stuff, you're going to have a bit of a different answer. The fact is we got it, and that is good. So one of the factors, in, in specifically in this geography, is the fact that the wind tends to really, really blow, right? We, we can get some real, real wind storms that come through that area that will take that snow and below it, far away from the field where it originally had landed. So how do we keep that at home? Well, one, we get some sunshine, puts a bit of a, a cap, right? We, we, it warms up the top, then it freezes again, get a bit of a cap on that snow so it doesn't easily as blow away. Or maybe we take some matters into our own hands and, and do some other things. Well, what else could we do? Well, this farm in southern Alberta, what they did was they pulled out their land roller because they grow a lot of special crops, pulled up the land roller, and started rolling the snow. Some it was Really an interesting video on Instagram and Twitter. It got a t- went totally viral. And there was a whole bunch of perspectives. On the Real Life Radio podcast on Monday, Peter Johnson and I, Wheat Pete, we talked about this, and I wanted to get his thoughts on whether or not he thought it would be effective. Here's that conversation. I, I, I'm interested in what you think about that practice. What, do you think it's effective? Yeah, and so, Sean, I, I think it's a really cool experiment because the last thing you want is for that snow to blow away. And you're in southwestern Alberta, Lethbridge, that, uh, that, that picture butte area, like, like the, the wind never stops in that region. So there's a pretty good chance it might blow away. Now, the other, the other question becomes, what are the temperatures? Because if the sun shines and it gets to you know, minus two, minus three Celsius, oftentimes that sun has enough power that the snow melts a little and gets a crust on it. And once that crust is on it, then it doesn't blow away. We see that here yeah. in southwestern Ontario all the time, right? So we we roll the snow so that it, it isn't going to blow. And do we actually gain enough for the trip over the field? It doesn't take a lot of horsepower to, to run over the field and it's dry. You're not causing compaction. I, I, I'm not worried about the costs for the most part, but I, it, the big question is, would it have blown away or not? And how much stubble did you have there to trap the snow? They said very and, little. And maybe, so I saw Gerard said, so on that, so yeah, you're exactly right. One, they're doing this to, because it doesn't look like it was going to be warm enough to get a cap on that, like that harder cap from the sun. So you're, yep. you're doing this yep. to get out you know, before the wind does because the wind will pick up all of this snow and it will punch it into <laughs> to, you know, counties and uh, over. So, But G- Gerard said that very little stubble and that they're planning to put Durham in into this field. So, But the, doesn't the moisture content of the snow kind of matter here? Because I was wondering about the... I was very curious about the pack that would be left behind the the less the less water content in that snow the less of a chance you get some sort of a pack on it right 100% and so how cold was it when the snow came was it heavy wet snow was it dry fluffy snow and just looking at the roller the little video that i saw on twitter it looked like it was fairly fluffy because the roller was pushing a nice bit of snow in front of it and my other thought process was how deep is that snow because here in Ontario, when we get snow, sometimes we get, you know, a foot of snow or 
or 30 centimeters, call it what you will, and trying to roll that much snow, I, I, without you would just get a big snow drift in front of the roller to the point where you probably couldn't couldn't actually pull it. Yeah. Uh, just just with that, but but if you you know if you have four inches or something like that, five inches, and and it's not wet snow, rolling it to to pack it down and try to make it less prone to that wind, it may well help. Now, the other the other question from that is if you only have four or five inches of snow, that like it's it's about four tenths of an inch of rain, right? It takes 10 inches of snow to equal one inch of rain. And so the, the it isn't like there's a ton of moisture in that snow that you're going to save and how much value that has. Uh, it depends on what happens after, right? Like yeah. what happens this spring. Yeah, you know what? And if uh, let's just hope Kara left a test strip, Pete. Let's just hope that she did. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll I'm going to oh, check. Sean, come on. <laughs> she worked with Real Egg long enough and, and heard me often enough. Uh, had to had to write the post for the word and and you know, Pete, he is all about leave the test strips. Surely, surely I've driven that into their heads enough that they left test strips. Yeah, cool stuff. You know what? Whether it works or it doesn't work, I I, I appreciate the thinking out of, outside the box, right? Like especially when yeah. you, you think about the severity of the drought, and and there's there's lots of adversity we face in this this industry. There's no doubt about that. But sometimes you got to kind of do some stuff that you know, give it a shot, try something that we've never done before we don't commonly do or maybe you saw somebody do it in some other geography think outside the box i, I kind of like it sean if we hadn't thought of outside the box and been open to to different ideas we never would have tried frost seeding and frost seeding that whole concept i think was sort of what pushed brian barris at at aafc Lethbridge to go out and try ultra early seeding cereals in Alberta and his data clearly shows that you should not wait for the 1st of April if you can run on the 15th of February and you have two degrees Celsius soil temperature get the wheat in the ground so the only the only way you move agriculture forward is to try new things and that means you have to think outside the box and I love when people do and is just leave the test strip so that once you learn something, you can tell Wheat Pete so he can tell the world because that's exactly what I love doing. So after we played this segment on Real Ag Radio, I asked the audience, what do you think? What's your feedback? It, it was all over the map. So I got an email here from Terry, who farms in Saskatchewan. He said, hats off to the family for trying something new. That is how we learn. I have to admit that my jaw dropped in my hand, hit me, my forehead at first thought of the concept. New ideas are great, but it saddens me deeply that most people respond to a problem with a bunch of steel and diesel fuel or spending more dollars on a product to help solve it. The best way to keep snow where it lands is with tall stubble. The taller, the better. I have used a stripper header to harvest my cereals for over five years now. The benefits just keep adding up as I gain more experience. More moisture added by snow is just the start. Also get less moisture lost to wind during the growing season. Sheltered growing environment for tender small plants. Plants, stabilize soil temps during hot temperatures, protection from soil surface compaction during heavy rain, soil actually warms up sooner in the spring, and I burn a lot less fuel at harvest. Uh, I farm in Saskatchewan, even this far north it works well, and I haven't had a single significant negative reason to stop using it. Hey, appreciate the email, Terry. That is, uh, that's Terry's thoughts. We also had an email here from Marshall who said, my two cents on snow rolling would be that I think that making ridges out in the field might capture more snow and keep it there. So that was Marshall's thought. And we love your thoughts. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Okay, we've got more coming up here on Real Ag on the weekend. We're going to be right back. You're listening to 650 CKOM and 980 CJME. I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one-hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. 
Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of The Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on The Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by BASF and Syngenta Canada. On realagriculture.com, we do a tremendous amount of video and podcast series. Now, one of the video series that we have going is called Farming Forward, okay? And this this week's episode that dropped was... It's really cool because it's actually with a Saskatchewan-based company doing a lot of really cool things in the precision space. It's Croptimistic Technologies, and we talked to Justin Deering, and I, I want to play some of the audio here for you. So SWAT maps are a soil, water, and topography map. Uh, we, we can do variable rate inputs for, for our clients, um, whether it be fertilizer, seed, um, or also uh, soil-applied herbicides. Um, we're, we're out there mapping the fields and getting getting an idea of what the soil properties are and from there then we we can create those prescriptions and yeah so describe a map to me what sort of things are you going to be looking for on it so when when we're out there getting a, a map made we're we're looking for those uh specifically the topographic features in the field um, any high ground any low ground and and getting a good comparison out there so when they're when they're mapping they're going on an 80 foot pass and then when they do see, come across, say, some um, low ground or a hilltop, they make sure that they get some extra data in, in those areas. So then when our map developers can uh, create those maps, then they send them off to me and I'm out there ground truthing. And I'm, I'm looking for things such as some, some gravel lenses, some sandier areas of the, of the field. That's kind of the, the upper zones. And then down to the lower zones, I'm looking for those high clay content soils as well as some saline patches. A lot of the time it's, it's looking at the different uh, colors and stubble type or also some uh, different weed types throughout the field. So walk me through the logistics of actually making a SWOT map. Yeah, so first steps are to get the get the field map. So as I said, it's on a on an 80 foot pass. They're mapping the field. It's they're they're essentially doing it the same as as our clients would with with any other pieces of equipment. And then once once a field is mapped, they uh, that information gets sent off to our map developers. They create up to 12 different maps for myself to come and ground truth. So that ground truthing process is uh, fairly labor intensive. Um, if, a, if a field goes well, it can take as, as short as 20 minutes, but I've had it take up to as long as three hours. So when we're out there ground truthing, ideally we have a soil sampling truck. If not, it's, it's with, a, with a shovel and, and we're checking to see, first we typically go to those high EC areas and check the, those zone ones, see, see if they're making sense on one side of the field versus the other side of the field. And, uh, and then we do that all the way down to our zone tens. Every, every swap map is zoned, is, is zoned uh, through one, one through 10. And so, yeah, we, um, we then make sure that that map makes the most sense for, for the field, get, get a best fit as, as we can. And then from there, the, that uh, map that we've, that we've chosen gets, gets soil sampled. And, and after that, we analyze the soil samples, work through with our clients to make sure that whatever plan that we have come up with with them uh, makes the most sense for them as well as for us. And then they can create those prescriptions. So when you say one to 10 zones, is that on a quarter section or wh what are you talking so about? So that's actually, um, Every single swap map is going to have 10 zones, whether it's a 10 acre piece of a, of a small little plot up to a, a thousand acre field. They're, they're all, we keep them consistent, 10 zones. That doesn't mean that each of those 10 zones is the same. So you can have fields side by side that a zone one in one field doesn't necessarily mean it's the same as the zone one in the other field. It's really kind of about the um, productive capability of those different areas of the field when in relation to water holding capacity. And what makes SWAT maps different from other soil and topography maps out there? So a lot of the other uh, maps that are out there, they're not necessarily layering in multiple layers like, like we are. Um, we, we weight our maps 
usually fairly heavily on, on EC data, so that's electrical conductivity. And then we, we layer in layers such as our topography or elevation, just depending on, on the field. So um, some, a lot of the time you'll have some anomalies throughout a field, some low ground that, that is with the EC map is showing that it maybe should be a zone one, but typically because those are water holding areas of the field, they end up actually being say bumped down to a, a zone six, seven or, or beyond. So. And now we're standing in a canola field. Canola is a huge user of nitrogen and, and nitrogen use efficiency is something that you look at when it comes to swap maps. Do you want to kind of elaborate on how those intertwine? Yeah, so really um, nitrogen use efficiency comes down to how well the the um, the plants are going to be using that that fertilizer so or even what's within the ground so um, and that really relates to the water holding capacity of the field so those those upper zones they're typically your driest areas of the field they're not going to be holding as much water down to your your mid slopes they're they're kind of your average areas of the field and then you have down to zone 10 so those are those are going to be flooded out areas so each one of those responds differently to to nitrogen um, you're going to have losses for different reasons those those drier areas it's going to be going to be losses because of it being so dry and and plants just not being able to take up that that nitrogen so then it's a loss in the environment and then down to those zone 10s where your losses are because of it being so wet and and typically then your nitrogen is leaching out so talk about how this information can be useful to a farmer when they're wanting to get you know fertilizer prices are constantly volatile and fluctuating and they want to get the most out of their nitrogen talk about how this is important yeah so they can then allocate resources accordingly a lot of the time it ends up being we're we're applying actually and what an average rate across the field of roughly around what they typically would be but we're applying the, the nitrogen in spots that actually needs it so then we can dial back the fertilizer on those on those hilltops because the production capacity isn't as, as high as it should be there or as it could be I should say and then um, we're allocating that those that, those inputs down to those middle areas of the field to your higher performing areas of the field and then also say your zone nines and tens where you're typically your your most saline areas they're going to have high residual nutrients in those in those spots so then we can then uh, move those resources out of those areas into those better performing spots of the field and how do you actually measure that nitrogen use efficiency so there's a few different ways to measure nitrogen use efficiency um, what what probably the simplest way is you uh, it's it's your ratio of your your crop yield versus what the crop is taking up for for nitrogen so what we can do is have that that initial soil sample and and then uh, have a good baseline of what the organic matter as well as what's the, what the nitrogen levels are within the field and also knowing how water is going to interact with the, with the organic matter we can get a, a good idea of what that mineralization nitrogen release would be from specific areas of the field and then we can then um, measure your yield after that and and get an idea of what what the nitrogen content is of of the seed and then after that it's just simple math you need a you need a soil sample afterwards and and then you can see what your starting soil soil nitrogen was what your end soil nitrogen and then what came out in the seed and I think one of the key messages here is practices like this aren't just good for the environment they're also good for the bottom line if you've got sustainable practices and you're getting a return Whoa, two thumbs up. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Real Ag on the Weekend. It's been a pleasure bringing it to you. Make sure you check out realagriculture.com, and you have yourself a great Easter weekend. Thanks so much for getting real and getting connected with Real Agriculture for Real Ag on the Weekend here on 650 CKOM and 980 CJME.